What's happening, guys, and welcome to our weekly Impact Wrestling Review. I'm Keith, and I'm joined by Ro. We are going to talk about the Rebellion pay-per-view that happened this past Sunday, and then talk about the Fallout episode of Impact. So what's going on, man? Not much, man. How you doing? I'm doing all right today. So what are your uh, overall thoughts of Rebellion? You know, I thought it was fine. Um, if anything, I thought some of the booking kind of just took me by surprise. Most notably, the uh, X Division and Knockouts title matches. Yeah, I think that was two matches that we thought... I mean, granted, they could have gone either way, but I thought that Jordan and Sammy were two people that were going to take the titles home, but unfortunately they did not um we had two matches added before the show took place we had a was it a six-man scramble with uh ace austin aiden prince eddie edwards jake chris jake diener and pd williams and then an intergender match of scarlet bordeaux and rohit raju so they opened the show with the six-man scramble which uh ace austin came away victorious after pd williams hit a canadian destroyer on jake diener and then ace austin uh i think rolled him up for a win uh which was good here i think uh ace was the right person to get this victory considering he's been showcased a decent amount on the show and uh him going over pd after them having a uh a little confrontation. I think it was it on the go home show or the show before that. I think it was on the go home show. Yeah. 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 And then we saw the match between these two take place on this week's episode of impact. Uh, this match was pretty short though, but you know, impact kind of does that just to get things, ro- the ball rolling to open the show. Uh, what'd you think of this match? Yeah, I thought it was cool. Um, simple fact. It seemed like a way to kind of kickstart, um, uh, a feud. I, I mean, I don't know if you want to call it a feud because you know, it seems like they just had one match. Uh, at, to uh, these tapings we're gonna cover, um, but just a way to kickstart the feud between Aiden, uh, Aiden, uh, Ace Austin, and uh, P. Williams. So yeah, not bad at all. They yeah. normally do this at each and every pay per view. They kind of have like an opener where it's like a multi man and X division match to kind of get the crowd going. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, and uh, since Eddie Edwards and Eli Drake, which we all thought was going to happen, was scrapped with Eli departing the company, this match was in, thrown in there, and then so was Scarlet versus uh, Rohit, which was up next, and uh, this was interesting how this all came about, because uh, Rohit was on social media, and he kind of threw jabs at scarlet and intergender wrestling and all this other stuff to which we learn news later on that rohit almost got fired for this because uh i guess uh he kind of played ed and they thought that he had gone too far and it seemed like the whole thing with eli drake was really to make a statement that they're not playing around with this type of stuff and uh, he was just a casualty of that eli that is yeah, the, I thought that news, you know, seeing that, because, um, you know, at first, at first, and he even mentioned, too, that they told him to go online and kind of essentially set something up, but I guess he just went too far, mm-hmm. and that's what they didn't like. I know we, we've talked about it before, like, look, not everyone's going to be on board with that stuff, and, you know, you got some saying, well, if you go against your employer, you know, you deserve to get fired, or whatever the case may be, but... You know, it, it, you know, they're, they're really kind of, um, you know, teetering a line between, you know, be, you know, ha- allowing talent to kind of, you know, express how they feel. And maybe it's something that they should do uh, behind closed doors as opposed to run to Twitter, you know, as opposed to like, well, this is what you're going to do. If you don't like this, you know, you're gone and stuff. But, um, you know, for this match, man, and you know me, I've stated on multiple occasions, I'm not big on, on intergender matches. Mm-hmm. I thought it was okay. Um, you know, once again, I hate the fact that, you know, it seems like every intergender match we see, you know, the men lose, the men tends to lose just because he does something obnoxious. And we've seen Rohit try to do a uh, go for the stink face. Like, the, you know, that's something that he doesn't normally do in matches, mm-hmm. you know, so... <laughs> Um, the one thing that I said is, while it was okay, if Rohit quit tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised. It would not surprise me one bit. Yeah, he didn't uh, seem too favorable to the booking of the uh, Desi Hit Squad. He kind of uh, 
you know, said that what we have said, and that's that they are no longer or never really considered a threat as is. So it's it's tough to buy them seriously when they're being thrown out there in tag matches because nine times out of ten, they're going to be on the losing end of things. But, uh, yeah, it was definitely interesting. Obviously, Scarlett went over here. I mean, it was good that Falaba was showcased on the pay-per-view, even just in the role where he was backing Scarlett. I think she went over with a, what, a pile driver or something? I don't even uh, remember. She did. A, I think it's called the, um, I think it's the jig and tonic. I, I don't know. It looks like it's like an Alabama slam. And then, you know, you drop him on the head. But, you know, I just wonder what Scarlett's character moving forward. Is this what they have for her? And, you know, we think about the knockouts division and we think about how at the moment it seems so thin. Like, I really don't see what she gains fighting lower level guys. Like, what is, she, is that going to put her in contention for the X division? Like, eventually you're going to run out of people and not everyone's going to be on board. You're not going to have her facing top talent having matches like this. Like, you know, you can only get away with it for so long. So it's just going to be interesting moving forward to see how they progress with her character yeah no absolutely um but you know this was just a lower card match so really no bearing on it outside of what took place i think at the pay-per-view i just think they wanted to throw something in there to showcase scarlet so that was basically it um and then we had uh what i thought was one of the best matches of the night was moose in the north versus the rascals i'm pretty sure you share the same opinion on this match Yes, this just this was a nice blend and a clash of styles by far. I mean, you know, I kind of figured, you know, when you got the three bigger dudes in Moose in the North, you know, facing the smaller guys and the Rascals. I mean, you know, you know, you're gonna get some, you know, fast paced stuff, but then <laughs> guys just getting tossed mm -hmm. <laughs> like nobody's business. Well, so, before yeah, the... I thought this was all around good. Yeah. Before the bell even rang, you just saw all six men standing, and it, the the size difference was just incredible. But uh, no, they put on a very uh, very good match. I enjoyed this a lot. Um, Moose in the North ended up going over, which we had predicted. It seemed like the most logical choice, but good job for them. They made it took a match that really had no bearing on it and just made it a fun fun match to watch. Yeah, one of the top matches of the night. I think we both had talked about. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, then we had the uh, knockouts championship with uh, Taya defending against Jordan Grace. Um, so this opened with Jordan Grace having full control of the match. I think she hit a uh, powerbomb on the apron of the ring, and um, I think Taya was able to work on Jordan's arm, right? I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And Probably. then Jordan hit a muscle buster, which Taya was able to kick out of, which was very surprising. Um, but then ultimately Taya went over with the, uh, road to Valhalla. So, um, caught by surprise here. Um, like I said, you, we both thought that Jordan was going to walk away with the championship considering she was undefeated. So, uh, Taya handing her, her first defeat seemed, uh, seemed a little strange, but the match overall was fine. I had no problems with, with the way it, it, it went and it was a good competitive match. You know, I think, and we see this in Impact, too, or I see this in Impact, too. You know, the one thing that kind of bothered me with this show and some of the matches, and we'll get to the other ones, but, like, with this one, for example, I'm not really a fan of false finishes. I think there's certain moves that once you hit them, like, that should end it. And I thought Grace hitting the muscle buster, like, I thought that should have been the three right there, personally. But, you know, Ty kicks out. You know, what took me by surprise is because I knew going into this, I said... The power couple, one of them's losing their titles. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just thought, I said, how whoever loses one, for, well, since Taya went on first, if Taya loses hers, then Johnny's going to retain his. So when Taya retained hers, I was just like, oh, I guess Johnny is for sure losing his. Um, You know, I seen online some people were saying, well, Jordan wasn't ready. Well, see, I hate using that excuse because I think they put her in this position. So if she wasn't ready, she probably shouldn't have gotten a title shot. And obviously, I know, you know, you can say, well, you know, the division's thin and, you know, Rosemary's tied up and Tess is tied up. So they didn't have anyone true. But you put her in a position where, you know, this was her third title match, mind you, you know. And, yeah, we had even talked about how random it was just given the fact that she debuted, 
you know, a couple months ago facing Katarina. They scrapped that entirely, uh, paired her with Kiera and did the whole undead junk, a dead realm junk. And then, you know, you put her in a title match and then she doesn't win. And then it's like, oh, well, she wasn't ready. And now it just seems like she goes to the back of the line, which, I mean, you know, you lose a title match. That's how it should go. But I just kind of just thought, like, you know, if the plan was for Taya to win, then so be it. But, you know, to say that Jordan didn't win because she did, wasn't ready, I just think that's kind of a lazy reason. Yeah, this was a clean finish, which, I, I you know, had it been, you know, a dirty finish, I guess it would have made a little more sense. But, uh, yeah, it is what it is. And, uh from the look of it, it seems like it's going to be Taya and Madison for the next feud. And it's so funny because remember we had thought that maybe that's what we're going to see Madison challenging mm-hmm. a Jordan or, you know, maybe down the road a Jordan and a Tessa. And I mean, we'll, we'll get to it later. But yeah, I, I just kind of just think like it, it kind of did Jordan a disservice in a way. I think a dirty finish would have probably helped more but to, yeah. for her to kind of lose clean um yeah i mean it'll be interesting to see how they use jordan moving forward if she'll just be a background person or will she still be in the mix yeah for sure uh and then we had the x division championship match where rich swan was defending against sammy callahan in an ove rules match uh the stipulation was made a few days before the pay-per-view and uh all members of ove were banned from ringside um, I thought this match, it, it was good. I had no real problems with it. I mean, it was kind of turned into just a hardcore match. Uh, I felt like it dragged on a little bit through a couple of parts. Um, a lot of spots that I thought were going to finish the match. I mean, we saw Sammy Callahan hit Rich Swan with a pile driver through one of the barricades that was set up between the, uh, the ramp and I think uh, another barricade. Uh, we saw a couple spots off the uh, turnbuckle. What, he hit a pile driver off the top rope? On top of a Lego, too. My yeah, name. on top of the Legos. <laughs> right, right, right. And Rich Swan had kicked out of that. And then uh, Swan ended up, or what, did Sammy pull out the barbed wire? No, I think it was Swan. Or no, you know, you yeah, might be right. I think it was <clears> Sammy <throat> pulled out the barbed wire. Uh, it was either a two by four or something like that. Or And... Uh, Rich Swan ended up using it and on the in a cross face maneuver to make Sammy Callahan tap out. Um, I yeah, thought this was uh, Sammy's Sammy's way to get some uh, championship gold, but unfortunately he's unsuccessful again. And uh, we were talking about this post pay per view, and you had made the joke that it seems like uh, Sammy Callahan has become Impact's Bray Wyatt in the sense that. So much potential to do things with him, yet he never gets those big victories. It's it seems, and you know what I didn't like, and like I was just mentioning about false finishes, is you know that pile driver off the top rope that should have ended it, like right there. Like I hate doing some of these, they were how they do some of these spots and some of these matches, you know, to kind of get the big pops, but then the match continues. It just as a fan, it takes me out because I think certain moves should end it. You know, it shouldn't take, you know, something off the turnbuckle or this like that. And then, oh, a DDT and that ends it. So um, in, in, while, you know, yeah, Swan retains, I was just disappointed because I thought this was Sammy's best opportunity to win some gold. The man's 0-3 in title matches. I've just come to the realization I don't think they see him as championship material. I mean, if later on I'm proven wrong, hey, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. But uh, they book him. He's pretty much a loser. Um, I I can ask you, Keith, name one significant win that Semi Callan has had in Impact. I mean, I think we we, we did speak about this, and it was the uh, Mexican death match, but that was after he had lost his hair to Pentagon. Right. anniversary. And then before that, you probably would say the uh, that six man at Bound for Glory where he yep. pinned Brian Cage after they did all those super kicks. Mm-hmm. But you know, you got a guy with a great char- a great character, and he's able to you know tell a, a great promo and really get you invested in whatever he has going on, only to come up on the losing end. And I compare it to Bray Wyatt because that's what they had done with Bray Wyatt, where when you know he was at the height of uh, his powers in a sense where, you know, he'd come out, you know, cut this great promo, tell this great story and get you really looking forward to a few that he was in only to lose. And 
I know people, some people look at Callahan as, you know, he's so great. He's putting people over and stuff. But it doesn't – it comes to a point where beating Callahan doesn't mean anything. There's no value to it because he's been booked to be a loser. If this was a guy who was like a former world champion and, you know, had all these accolades on underneath his belt and you're beating him, like say like Jericho, who, you know, Jericho tends to lose a lot too. But he's accomplished so much where it's like, hey, that's a big deal beating him. But you got Callahan where – and and it, it would even hurt OVE in a sense who just got a new member and you got this guy losing, you know, he never wins the big one. As I say, like, I just think overall it hurts and it's just such a shame because yeah. he's one of their guys. We talk about, you know, star power and this and that. And if they really kind of took a chance with them, they could have it. But when you have this guy losing right and left, you know, they give him a win here and there, but he never, you know, Not has that big, big win. That yeah. big win, it hurts him. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. Um, you know, he kind of wanted to be the person that turns things around in Impact Wrestling. He's kind of put them on his back in certain situations, but it just seems like he... Uh, he never got anything for it. I mean, the guy was voted, what, the Wrestler of the Year of 2018 for Impact Wrestling? I think the MVP. And they yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't understand. Like, this, and another thing, too, people will say, uh, where well, I've seen some say, well, I'm glad Swan retained. Callahan is an X Division guy. Well, if, this, if that's what we're going to use, then why the hell was he booked in a X Division title match? Why not make it a non-title match? <laughs> Which yeah. is funny because it ended up just becoming a hardcore match, right? And and you you could have done that. And I mean, yeah, people would have would have probably said too. Well, why wasn't the X Division title defended? But you can say he's not X Division. And let's face it, we don't know what X Division is at this point. I mean, if you go run and do a dive, they can consider that X Division. They haven't really clarified it. Um, we see that been, in every match, though, man. Yeah, it's been kind of considered a de facto mid-card title, you know, without them really kind of saying it. So there's really no clarification. So I just really thought, you know, had they done the title match, I mean, a title change here, I thought we could have really seen something with him. And, I mean, he could have easily put over someone down the road, you know, a typical, you know, exhibition style guy, you know, being a high flyer. But, yeah, I just thought this was just a, a missed opportunity. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. But uh, again, we'll just have to wait and see where it goes from here. It seems like they are building up a certain X Division star. So I think that will probably be the next feud. But we'll talk about that when we get to the review of this past week's show. And then I, up next, we had the special attraction match of Tessa Blanchard versus Gail Kim. Now, I think it was right before the pay-per-view took place. Gail was, in an inter- was interviewed and said that after this match, she would probably be having back surgery. So I was like, oh, I guess um, that's going to make things a little interesting for this match. And then they went out there and Gail took a hell of a lot of bumps that I didn't expect her to take. And this was probably the match of the night for me. Oh, by far, by far. Yeah, I, I was concerned about that, too, because I'm like, for somebody uh, having uh, back surgery or going to get back surgery to take those type of bumps like that's a uh, that's something but uh yeah this was very good and you know credit to Gail she put Tessa over in a big way I mean you could have done anything from like a dirty finish or some type of roll up but she straight out tapped clean like yeah that's that's how you put somebody over and you know big ups to Tessa I think this was a monumental moment for her um They can go so many routes with her now. I'm guessing a face turn might be in the works, but uh, I think the follow with this is going to be key. I mean, you can't have her beating, you know, a Hall of Famer and Gail Kim and then having her, you know, do some stupid stuff. But, you know, we just got to wait and see. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we had uh, Tully Blanchard ringside and uh, Gail Kim's husband was in the crowd as well. So, you know, they they made this out to be a big match and it delivered. Um, but no, yeah, this was this was really good, and I thought both women just kind of went balls to the wall for the, this match. Yeah, I mean, match of the night. I mean, if they would have, let me ask you, if they would have closed the pay per view with this, would you have had a problem? Absolutely not. It would have been fit. It would have been fitting. I, I mean, I guess second to the last, but I really thought if if they would have closed the pay per view with this, I think it would have been perfect. Yeah, yeah, especially at the end where you know. Tessa shook Gail's hand and they kind of just had a moment in the ring. 
and mm -hmm. uh, it was fine. And I think a lot of people, or not a lot of people, I should say, there were some people that didn't care for that that much. But you know, that was kind of Gail proving herself that she could go, and she was as good as she says she was. You know, it's funny because for as much as, you know, as vocal as I was about, like, you know, what's the whole purpose of this? Like, you know, it really kind of changed my mind. Like, it gave Tessa that win. And, you know, it shows you that Tessa's, uh, you know, going to be, well, she already has shown, but, you know, going to be a big deal and that uh, impact. So, yeah, know, it turned out well. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I can see the knockouts main eventing any show if they uh, if they build the match correctly. So uh, another wait and see approach, and then we had the uh, Impact World Championship, Johnny Impact defending against Brian Cage, and um, this was uh, an overbooked mess. Is that is that fair? <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, felt like there was a lot they could have done differently in this match. I mean, you know, the outcome. I'm I'm glad it happened. I think you know them taking a chance with Brian Cage was, I guess, the right move. However, the way it came about, I don't. I think they could have done differently because the whole story here was that Brian was constantly screwed out of every opportunity he had. You add special guest referee Lance Storm, who was going to call it down the middle, and this should have been, in my opinion, Brian Cage just full dominance, no one screwing him over, and... He just wins cleanly, and, and that was that. But that did not seem to be how they booked it here. You know, it's one of these things, man, where, you know, you see, you know, hey, you know give Impact a chance. You know, they've really changed stuff. If you're a casual person barely turning tuning in and you caught this match right away, you're thinking typical old TNA, you know, world title match, special guest referee, referee gets involved, outside interference, you know, screwy finish, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you know, same old, same old. And it's something that they ha haven't been able to shake. Like, they can't help themselves. Um, the moment that they put Lance Storm in, I had already, you know, had my reservations. Like, geez, man, you know, he's going to get involved in some way. And, you know, credit to them, the way that it started, it was fine. But I think when Brian Cage got injured during yeah. that, uh, uh, the Spanish fight, that's another thing, too, what I'm starting to notice. Like, they're spots taking for some, spots. Yeah, they're doing some <laughs> of these spots, man, for these pops. And it's, you know, people are, you know, the wrestlers are kind of going all balls to the wall. And you can appreciate that as a fan. But health comes first. You know, these guys are taking years off their guys and gals, I should say, taking years off their lives to try to entertain. Like, I think some of these spots they need to dial back from, you know, this like that Spanish fly from the ramp to the floor. Right. Mind yeah. Me. Like, why wow, looks cool. You know what I'm saying? But look, look at the aftermath of it all. And, and that. No you, you, no, you finish. No, I'm just saying, and that's what kind of uh, brought down the quality of the match, so to speak, because Brian Cage, you know, he was messed up, and they just had to kind of, kind of get through it. Yeah, no, and it's not like Impact is the only company he works for. Now he's injured, he's out. We don't know how long he's going to be out for. Now he's got to take all these other shows off that he was going to get paid for, and, you know, that's that's the tough thing when you have talent working for so many different promotions. It's why I kind of said with the difference between like exclusivity and in inclusivity, <laughs> I always struggle saying those <laughs> words, man. I think it's just, you know, if you're at a promotion and I know people will always use WWE and, and WWE is probably a great example because they can afford to do that because of the salaries. Um, I think, you know, if you're at a promotion that, you know, is going to pay you well, then there's no need to work other shows, you know, outside of just the love of it. But I just think, you know, with Impact, you know, Impact probably plays decent to certain talent. And, you know, you go and work other shows that kind of make, <clears throat> excuse me, that extra or supplemental income. But, yeah, it, it, it'd it be no different. Could you imagine if he took a spot like this on one of his other shows and he couldn't he couldn't uh, compete at Rebellion? Yeah. Right, right. It, it would, you know, it'd be all in shambles. But, uh, um, you know, nonetheless, you know, he's finally champion. Um, congratulations to him. I know you joked about his coronation, but he finally got the title. But now the question is, 
how long is he going to remain champ? And I know we'll talk about it when we review the show, but you know, with this injury, you know, he wasn't at tonight, you know, the, uh, tonight show, the May 3rd show. Um, and it looks like he wasn't at the Philadelphia tapings either. So yeah. we might run into a situation where no world champion on TV for a good month or so. And I don't know how that resonates. Yeah. Um, but to get back to the match, we don't know, you know, how much was an audible because there was clearly points in the match where Johnny and cage were just winging it because cage couldn't power through anything. Um, we saw that weird table spot and, you know, them just utilizing everyone that was ringside to get involved because of how bad, I guess, cage was hurt. Um, I mean, he was able to hit a drill claw, obviously not very pretty because, you know, the back injury is, uh, will take you completely out of the game. But that was uh, that was the finish. And then we saw the debut of uh, Michael Elgin and he came out and hit Brian Cage with an Elgin bomb, which I'm sure didn't do him any service as well. But uh, but that did give them something, a talking point heading into the tapings post rebellion. Um, so what are your uh, initial thoughts of Michael Elgin when he debuted? You know, I've only known of him. I wasn't too familiar with him. But um, I had thought, I was like, okay, this is a great acquisition. Um, I know it's funny, right away, you know, he comes in going for the title. But, you know, that's how you make an impact, so to speak. You know, you want to go and go at the top dog. I did, too, just think, like, you know, do, him doing a power bomb while I uh, understand the effect of it all, um, you know, with the guy with Cage, who already was a compromiser, probably wasn't the best idea. Um, I just said this, and I remember I went to Twitter and I said this. I know he kind of has some um, baggage with him, and you know, people have their different opinions of it. Of it all, I say this: like, I think it's a great, it's a good get. I just hope if the backlash is as significant as it's being portrayed, I hope he's more. He, he's not as much as trouble. I mean, more, I forgot what the phrase was. In other words, I hope he's worth it. Like, you know, his, his, the acquisition of him is worth more than, you know, the trouble that it could bring. Like if he's more trouble than he's worth, then I think that's a bad, th- bad thing. But if it's, if he's worth all of that, then, you know, good, good get by impact. Yeah, no, um, that's obviously something we're not going to touch upon because it's, you know, not necessary in this aspect to bring it all up because I don't think anybody knows the complete facts with things. But a uh, very, very talented wrestler. I was a big fan of his in New Japan. And I think there was rumors that Don wanted to bring Elgin in initially, but due to everything that had taken place, they decided against it. But, um, you know, bringing him in now and he can easily be brought in as a top guy he's a big guy very good in the ring powerful guy and it seemed like uh him versus cage would be a uh, very good matchup but we will see if that match eventually happens yeah um you know i think you had mentioned it and not to touch too much into it but the only p- point i wanted to make was because you were saying some people were talking about how they're not going to watch because he's there you know i just say just with a lot of things in society it's selective outrage. I think a lot of people, or some, I don't know, probably didn't like Elgin the wrestler. So to hear whatever that is, that just kind of gives more of a reason. But um, it's selective outrage. I think you know these people are people too, you know, and stuff happens, and you never know all the facts, and it's easy to pick a side and roll with it. So, but with that said, yeah, I you know I like the acquisition. You know, he's a big guy, you know, somebody that can go toe to toe with a Brian Cage. And I think that's what you need. So, yeah, not bad. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when he wants to kind of change his, you know, the perception of himself from people. So I think uh, they did a good job with that. Uh, And then we have the main event, which uh, I just want to bring up that I'm very glad that the world title match did not main event the show because I think that would have been even more of a disaster because that was one of the biggest problems with homecoming is that that was what was talked about coming out of the show. Yeah, true. So we have the tag team title match, full metal mayhem, uh, Lucha brothers defending their titles against LAX. Um, again, 
similar to what took place with Brian Cage and Johnny Impact, a Spanish fly where Phoenix did one off of the ladder onto the entrance ramp and landed almost on his head, uh, which would have been a very terrible thing had he been injured, but he was ultimately okay. But another time where it just felt like the spot wasn't necessary. Yeah, I just don't get it. You know, you're taking years off your life. And, you know, these are guys who work everywhere. So um, I'm guessing the money's just that good. (laughs) I I (laughs) guess. They go, you know, the ball's out. But, uh, you know, this was essentially another hardcore match. And what I thought was kind of weird because you had one earlier with the Swan and Sammy. Um, I was surprised that LAX won the titles here. Only because it kind of led to me thinking that maybe that the Lucha Brothers are departing. And I know they were in the montage for uh, Slammiversary, but, you know, things change. You know, Eli was on the poster of Rebellion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And look what happened. So um, I was just surprised just because with LAX, as great as they are, and don't get me wrong, like they're the the top team for Impact. We've just kind of seen the story before. And it's just the booking of you know the teams that they face they run through everyone and then there's nobody that left for them to face so hopefully that's not what happens to this go around but uh um yeah i was just surprised i I really thought lucha brothers were retaining yeah no i I actually had picked lax um because i thought that the value of the lucha brothers was much higher with them separate especially with them losing talent and I feel like they could have filled roles better that way, but I completely see your point. Um, but we did see Pentagon in singles action along with Phoenix during the, uh, tapings post rebellion. Uh, but no, I thought this match was, was good. Uh, they gave it a lot of time. It went over 20 minutes with, uh, like you said, LAX picking up the titles after, I guess they were going for a street sweeper from the ladder. I guess there was what tax on the ladder uh, on the table below but um the move didn't didn't work out and i think uh what did ortiz just power bomb him off the off the ladder mm-hmm. yeah so that that was that and like i said it, it was it was fine for what it was uh i guess they just wanted to add a different element into the feud because we've seen just what was this the fourth match between the teams yes i believe yeah i believe so yeah and the other ones were just straight up matches so i guess this being a stipulation match did make more sense give us something a little different and uh no i thought it was fine and i i thought uh, the end of the show was interesting because lax picked up the victory they all hugged which which was fine to close out the feud and then you had half the roster come out and kind of support the um, the lucha brothers and lax and almost like a send-off for the lucha brothers yeah i thought that was weird um you know, yeah, I thought I was saying the same thing, only to see them compete on Impact. Um, I, I'm guessing that's just kind of one of these things. And I know ECW used to have the tendency of doing that when they had, like, this crazy match. You know, you'd have some of the roster coming out, kind of uh, congratulating everybody. Um, it just seemed weird. But we had seen this even in Mexico when the Lucha Brothers won the tag titles. Uh, the roster had came out. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think that aired, did it? I thought I thought we just saw pictures of that. Uh, you know, I don't even remember. You you might be right. Yeah, I, I do remember it happening though. So, but uh, so yeah, that that was rebellion overall. I thought it was it was a good show. Um, I mean, to be fair, since the new regime has taken over, the quality of the pay per views has never been a question for me because it it's obviously more wrestling heavy and i think the quality of matches has obviously increased since they did back back in the day of tna and earlier regimes but um you know it was all on the booking and while i disagreed with some of their calls i i thought overall it was a good show and then too i think the big thing to look at is um this along with homecoming this is essentially their um i like to call their b Mm pay-per-views because we know their two top ones are slammiversary and bound for glory so i mean to expect them to like knock this out of the park which you know some felt that way which is good i mean i thought for it being you know b level event i I thought it was fine like i said you know some of the uh 
decisions and of, of course the false finishes I wasn't a fan of but um you know they you know put on a, a decent show yeah I, I would agree with that and so now we will move on to the um May 3rd episode of Impact which uh Michael Elgin opens up the show he comes out he kind of runs down Brian Cage you know saying where is the newly crowned champion oh that's right thanks to me he is not here um, he tells us that he left Japan to come to Impact to win the World Championship, and he's the only one that deserves it. This brings out Johnny Impact. He obviously compares Elgin to Brian Cage. Elgin then jokes about Johnny's balls being in his wife's purse. Uh, they argue about who put Cage in the hospital. Johnny says he has a rematch clause, so he's number one in line. Conan then comes out, and he says that he represents Pentagon now since everybody's all family. Uh, Johnny makes fun of Pentagon's title reign. Conan makes fun of Johnny's acting career. He says Pentagon, you know, never got his rematch. So he's number one. Johnny's number two. Elgin's number three in line. And then Elgin puts his hands on Conan to send a message to Pentagon. This brings Pentagon out. Pentagon and Elgin go at it. Security comes out. Johnny kind of stands there and they get separated. Um, I thought this was a strong opening segment. Um, Like I said, bringing Pentagon into singles action was a good move. Uh, Elgin, obviously seems like he's a decent guy on the mic, which uh, I feel like we've seen more from him on the mic than we saw Brian Cage in his whole uh, run so far. And uh, Johnny is still in the mix. So what do you think here? Nah, I loved this opening. Um, that's a way, you know, when you're talking about debuting a guy and wanting to make him be a big deal, you got him coming out, you know, wanting to challenge the top, the top guy. And then, you know, you got somebody, you know, the former champ, which I was surprised you know, their whole rematch clause seems so circumstantial. <laughs> sometimes we hear about it, sometimes we don't. Mm-hmm. You know, he's talking about, well, won't, don't I get my rematch? And then uh, Pentagon, and you just had mentioned about the value of the Lucha Brothers being split. Like, this is good for him. This is a good spot for him. You know, we look at the main event picture. I mean, it's not really solidified. And, you know, to have him have him in the mix, I think that gives, you know, extra... Um, opportunity to you know do matches with him and whatnot so i really liked this yeah no i definitely a strong way to open the show post pay-per-view and then we had our first matchup of the evening and that was ace austin versus pd williams i thought this was a very good match they put on a good back and forth match uh ace austin eventually comes away with the fold so good to see pd putting him over um and like i said or was alluding to when we were talking about the X Division title match. I think Ace Austin may be the next contender for Rich Swan. He has kind of solidified himself as a heel, so I think that that will work. I mean, we've still seen that Rich Swan is not done with their feud with OVE, but I think uh, the matchup next week will hopefully uh, finish that up. You know, it's interesting with that. As first, you know, I, I want to say, yeah, this was a great match. Um, obviously, the right guy went over and credit to PD for making Ace Austin look look good in this. Um while I think he should probably be or probably most likely be the guy next in line for X Division title shot. I do wonder if with Johnny's uh future X Division title shot, if that's something that'll fall by the wayside or they actually will do something with that because I think if he gets a title match against Swan, he's beating Swan for that title. Mm-hmm. And if he beats Swan for the title, then that kind of puts Ace the Ace Austin, you know, X Division title hunt, you know, on the back burner. Because obviously, you know, with Johnny. And um so yeah, I really want to see how that how what, what happens with that. Well, don't worry, man, because I know you watched the YouTube version, but we'll be we'll be bringing that up a little later on in the show. <laughs> so then we have an OVE promo. Sammy says obviously he got screwed at Rebellion because his family was banned from ringside. He challenges Swan to a four on four match, and he says, you know, since you're no not a part of our family, go find your family and uh, we'll make it a match. So that is going to happen next week. And then we had Rosemary versus Kiera Hogan. Um I, I thought they did a decent job with this match. I thought it was booked well. Um Kiera didn't take a pin, which I was worried about because I feel like she is someone they can definitely build up, but she just needs some wins under her belt, and it's tough to do considering, I guess, right now she's the low person on the totem pole. Uh, we see Rosemary in control at one point. They were on the outside. Sue Young comes out. 
with the undead brides. They attack Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary did have the undead maid of honor chained up on the ring post throughout the match. Um, so Kiera gets up and she contemplates helping Rosemary, but kind of turns around and goes to the back. We see Su Young hit the panic switch on Rosemary and uh, they all stand tall. So uh, what'd you think here? You know, I thought this was just mainly to uh, made to progress an angle between Sue and uh, Rosemary, which is mm. always fine. I can't appreciate Kara facing somebody different uh, because you think about the past couple of months, it was just her versus Sue or her versus Allie when Allie was still with the company. So, you know, to, for her to face Rosemary, it gives her something different. Now, it's going to be interesting to see what role she plays in the, in Sue versus Rosemary. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I think that was just a bigger thing to kind of uh, lead towards the, what happens between Sue and Rosemary. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think later on it was announced a uh, match between Sue and Rosemary happening down the line. I don't know if it's next week or not, but uh, that's going to happen. Uh, then we have Taya. She's interviewed by Melissa. She says that she has beaten every single person on the roster or in front of her, I should say, or that impact put in front of her. Um, then Madison walks up. She says she is 2-0 against Taya, and that makes her number one contender. Taya says that's not how things work. She says you may get a match against me, but it won't be the one you want. So then we go to commercial and come back, and Melissa's outside impact management's office. You can hear people talking. Uh, Taya walks out and says that contractually she doesn't have to defend her title for 30 days. She says Madison can have her match next week, but it won't be for the knockouts title. Kind of what we figured. You know, this is the Taya that we should have seen. Like, it seems now that Johnny's not champion. Like, Taya's kind of focused on her own thing. I liked all of this. You know, for even just a little thing where she pointed out, you're not going to do me like you did my husband, having him have to fight every single person right. and stuff. Like, you're not going to do me like that. And I like, you know, little little things like that. Like, I kind of wish this is, was the tie that we got. You know, instead, she was so tied up with Johnny stuff. But now Johnny's not champion. It, the focus can be on her. Um, yeah, I, I had no problem with this. I thought this was fine. Um, this sets up, I'm guessing, her next uh, challenger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know who who else you know they gonna they're gonna have position to uh, uh, take it, but uh, yeah, uh, no no problems with this at all. It reminded me a little bit of a uh, Mick Foley. I remember when Mick Foley was a world champion uh, in TNA. Um, he had a thing. I forgot he had just defended the title. He said, "I'm only defending this title." Um, I think he said once a year, which obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> that surpasses the thirty uh, thirty day. Uh, of stipulation but yeah uh no problems with this at all i kind of just wish we got this tie beforehand yeah i mean she was kind of i guess just because of the role she was put in against jordan because jordan was also kind of booked as a powerhouse because ty is uh ty is a pretty tall woman i think she's like five six or seven and jordan was only five foot so in that role i guess jordan was still the powerhouse but um yeah no i i, I like this and i think this will this will be fine. I, I think Taya will will still hold on to the championship, but uh, but we'll see how this goes. And then we have LAX backstage. They're celebrating their victory at Rebellion. Conan says that we may have extra gold in the family. You know, alluding to Pentagon possibly getting that world championship back. Um, they bring up the point that the Rascals have invited them to their treehouse, and then Conan takes their money and booze and tells them it's time to train. However, next week, I think it's going to be LAX versus, um, well, well, we'll get to that in a minute because that'll, that'll come up. <laughs> uh, but then we have Eddie Edwards versus Phoenix. Um, so Eddie is in control. We see Killer Cross show up on the ramp. He's kind of just staring down Eddie. Eddie starts focusing more on Killer Cross. Cross moves closer to the ring. He grabs the kendo stick. He starts to hand it to Ken, uh, to Eddie. Uh, Eddie tries to take it from him. Cross won't let go. Phoenix obviously takes advantage of the distracted Eddie and then um, hits the muscle buster sit-out driver. I don't think there's a name still for the move, but uh, Phoenix ends up getting the victory here. You know, this on paper, it seemed, you know, for me, it seemed like it was going to really be good. I don't know if it was just a clash of styles, but it was hard for me to get in 
get into it. I'm not saying that it was a bad match, but you know, I, I don't, I don't know. Something just didn't click for me. Um, you know, we see Cross. It's always good to see Cross, but you know, once again, you know, it's kind of just a random <laughs> thrown together, that thrown, uh, excuse me, thrown together feud. Uh, you know, we just seen him uh, feud with. Well, I don't even want to say feud. Where he had a match with Willie that was kind of random. Now it's uh, with Eddie. Um, I really hope they can find something. I think a program with Eddie can do him wonders. You know, it doesn't have to be too long, but they can find something because, you know, Killer Cross is way too talented. It kind of just be a background guy. Um, you know, I've kind of just come to to terms to, and accepted that, you know, he's probably not going to be in the world title picture. I think them days are, are done. Uh, but yeah, man, you, you know, I just, I hope they can find something else for him instead of, you know, him just appearing, just facing random people. Yeah. Well, it was funny because earlier on in the match, I think Don had made, um, I guess similarities between cross and Eddie and then cross shows up. So it's just kind of like it was telegraphed there. But, um, I mean, I, I think we did see when cross became, Aries' bodyguard was when he was feuding with Edwards, right? Because then they he? had I don't, even, I don't yeah, even remember. Yeah, because then they had that tag match because Moose was supposed to be Eddie's partner, and that's when Moose turned on Eddie, and we got that whole feud there, which led to the Bound for Glory tag match with Dreamer and Eddie versus Cross and Moose. So there's another tag team that we didn't get to really see take off <laughs> yeah yeah that would have been i mean you could have put them against the lucha brothers and that would have that would have been good too but that eh, it is what it is man that's right it. that's it but uh yeah no i would assume eddie and cross will be a feud i guess it's just kind of uh who they got who they got hanging around doing nothing so let's put them together and since it's killer cross and eddie i'm sure the feud will be fine uh, and then we have Swan and Tommy Dreamer backstage. Dreamer says he'll be on his team next week. Swan says Willie will also be there. Scarlet shows up and says, you guys are looking for a foursome. They allude to her teaming with them, but she says she has something bigger. Falaba shows up, and Falaba will be the fourth man in that eight-man tag for next week. So that 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 should be fine. Um, you know, utilizing Falaba, at least in, in any role, is good good in my book. You know what? When I seen this advertised, I thought this was gonna happen on this show. I didn't know it was for next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that it is. Um, and then we have the return of RVD. He comes out and he says he could talk about all the matches he could have here with the stars, but he's here because he's RVD. Uh, he says he can see how many people he that on the roster that he has influenced, but he's here to show the difference between imitation and the whole effing show. This brings out Ethan Page, which RVD right away says, who are you? Uh, they have a pretty good back and forth. Uh, you know, Ethan's a good promo guy, so he was able to get out some good stuff. Uh, but this ends with uh, RVD hitting a Van Daminator on Ethan Page, and uh, this will apparently be a match that takes place next week between the two of them. Um, so RVD has returned. You know, I thought, uh, uh, did a great promo in this, man. Um, you could say he was kind of, he outdid our RVD in a sense. Um, I really thought it was good. I mean, I know we kind of, you could kind of see how it was setting up, but RVD returning, um, my first impressions, he looked a little bit, um, let me, you know, let's <laughs> he was on the, the medicine. Check. Yeah, he was on the medicine, as uh, Paige alluded to. And Don had as well, and he's like, oh, I wish I had some medicine. I was like, yeah, I should have some too. Yeah, Don tonight, man, he was uh, a <laughs> rare form, you know, pipping out the Impact Plus, talking about he's been on it for days, even though it had released <laughs> just this past week. Um, and then that, yeah, um you know, I'm interested to see the match only because, like, like I said, from what I've seen at United as we stand, um, yeah, he just looks kind of like over the hill. And I gave him the benefit. I just figured, you know, maybe he hadn't wrestled in a while, and maybe he just needs to get in ring shape. But you know, looking at him now, and <laughs> it's so funny because I just most recently seen a YouTube clip of RVD when he was um, 
going at it with Stone Cold when they were doing the whole alliance thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that was back in 2001. So you just see this young RVD real <laughs> up, upbeat and stuff. And, you know, you see him now just kind of sitting back, kind of essentially looking like that uncle at the poker <laughs> table. <laughs> you know? I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to be me and stuff. So, um, yeah, 18 I'm years to, later, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm interested to see the match and hopefully it's, you know, Ethan, because I'm assuming he's losing this. Hopefully he can get a, a decent rub. I do think it's odd only because I thought that with Ethan Page being a part of the North, like to see him kind of uh, um, separate and do do something. And then, like I said, this is probably just a one off. I did find that weird, you know, but, you know, it is what it is. Well, we go backstage and. Alexander and there's Ethan Page. Alexander is pissed at Page. He says, Page says, I got it, but I got a match with RVD for the North. Alexander says, No, you got a match for Ethan Page. We're here to run the tag division. Moose walks up and he says, well, What's going on with all the yelling? He says, Look, we don't need to yell. Ethan can go take care of RVD and I'll team, team with you to take on LAX next week. So at least they did a, a, good, a good thing here. I like what they did in using all uh, three men from the match at rebellion. Um, so, so that, that was something. Um, but I mean, Moose and Alexander versus LAX, that should be a good match next week. It should, but <laughs> I think we can already predict where that's headed. You know, like, like I said, um, and, and I, I know we got one earlier, but you know, it wouldn't hurt to have LAX just cut out, cutting a promo and then somebody coming out and actually, challenging them and setting something up instead of jumping right into a match but i mean you know that's just kind of what we what we get now but it, yeah it should be good i'm not gonna lie to you yeah i, I didn't say the outcome won't be predictable but you know, <laughs> i think the quality of the match should be just fine yeah and anytime we get moose on tv is a good thing uh then we see the events that took place uh post gale and tessa match from rebellion they kind of talked with tully blanchard and had a little moment with him and tessa um, and then we have our main event, which was Johnny Impact versus Michael Elgin versus Pentagon. So Johnny came out with the X from the United We Stand match. And Johnny kind of, I mean, uh, yeah, Johnny Bravo held it onto that title, uh, onto the X throughout the match. So it looks like it is in play. So they are probably going to do something with it down the line. I'm glad this wasn't something that went by the wayside. You know, my thing, and I think we can talk about it more after the match I wanted to elaborate on, but my thing is, do they pull the trigger on it if they don't know how long Brian Cage is going to be out? Because I think with Johnny being, um, you know, obviously a top guy, I mean, if he's X Division champion, you know, you can essentially have him closing out the shows, you know, holding the belt, mm -hmm. so, to, so to speak, so... But anyways, as far as with with this match, man, uh, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I thought this was good. good. Um, Elgin, I mean, I know some people could probably easily say like, well, the like guy barely just got in. He got this big win. But this is the way that you put over somebody big when you want to make them seem like a big deal. And, um, you know, he just comes across as a guy that's believable that could actually take on Brian Cage and defeat Brian Cage. I think the biggest thing when you're talking about somebody of Brian Cage's caliber is he's so, you know, big and booked you know in a way where you know it doesn't seem like a whole lot of people can beat him so i think elgin was a perfect choice but this match overall i i this was what i was looking forward to most and it yeah. delivered for me absolutely um and you know this wasn't a singles match where elgin was going to squash somebody and somebody was gonna have to get uh beaten just to put him over so the triple threat was the right way to go we had a little nice tower of doom spot where uh I guess Elgin was going to superplex Pentagon, and then Johnny got in with a little springboard German suplex on Elgin, so that was cool. Uh, it looked like Pentagon had hurt his knee. Uh, they were going for some sort of Hurricane Rana where Johnny was on the top rope and Pentagon was on the apron. Uh, that did not end up happening. I think Johnny went to jump and ended up kicking Pentagon in the face. Pentagon went down. So it looked like Johnny was talking to Pentagon. Another audible had to be called here. So Johnny just took him out with a chair, which was fine. And he, they used this because triple threat match is a no DQ match. Um, Johnny goes to set up Starship Pain in the ring with Elgin. He misses. Elgin hits a clothesline followed by a buckle bomb and then the Elgin bomb for the win. Number one contender. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I thought this was uh, this was booked really well, and uh, I think the right man went over. Uh, we agree. I mean, this this was good. The moment that we uh, um, heard it was announced, man, I was just like, okay, this is what's up. Um, just because it's some new fate. Well, and, and I know in Johnny's case, he's a former champ, so it's fine. But just some new faces in the main event, like you can always appreciate that. So then, you know, once Brian Cage comes back, you know, he has more to work with. Yeah. No, absolutely. And uh, like you had said earlier on, Cage missed the rebel the tapings in Canada, along with the at least night one of the tapings at the twenty three hundred arena. So. We're unsure if how long he's going to be out. There was, I think, Wrestling Inc. posted the article saying that he will miss the tapings and possibly more in the future. So, you know, if they strip him of the title, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something they did. I would, you know, think they would go like a tournament route or something like that where the winner, you know, ends up facing uh, or gets the title and then cage gets a rematch down the line when he's better or something like that. But, uh, if that is the case, I think they need to take advantage of it and do something different, get people invested in what's going on. Cause keeping your champion off TV for a couple months or at least a month and a half with the two sets of tapings is, uh, it's, it's tough because you know, that's supposed to be your main event picture. And, uh, there's only so much you can do without the champion there. Yeah, that, that's what I really wanted to get into because that's probably was like the biggest news of the week was because uh, I think he's not working either Philadelphia taping. So he's not working uh, tonight's as well mm-hmm. of Saturday's taping. You know, it sucks because like, you know, we talked about, you know, we've seen this guy, you know, been chasing the title. And, you know, we both had joked about, you know, they're just opening the, you know, clearing the path for him to win the title but you know he finally gets it and you're happy for him because that's a you know a milestone for any wrestler's career and you know he uh, went on to social media talking about you know how no one had given him a chance and never wanted to put him as you know the their promotions champion and impact did that so you love that and it's just unfortunate it comes at a time when he gets hurt uh, um with that said just given how they tape I'm hoping they strip him only because there's no way that you can justify not having your world champion on these tapings. While I get, you know, he's hurt, obviously, you know, we all know that, but just still though, just that's going to be what that's probably going to lead us into what June, no world champion. And then just say, if you did keep it on him and he comes on on that show and then he's just going to jump right into something like it just, it, it's not good. And we've seen this and I'll use a prime example. And I know it's different in a sense because he wasn't hurt. But you think about when Brock Lesnar was world champion, um, you know, Brock Lesnar now, not from back then, like, you know, where you'd have months where he's not on the show. So you have a show without a world champion. It hurts, man. You know, like, yeah, you can try to propel your mid card title. And that's why I was saying maybe they go the route with Johnny Impact winning the X Division champion ship where then that way he can close out the show which it does help the exhibition title mm-hmm. you know, a bit you know elevating that you know having it close out shows but it's just it just hurts and i really think if they really wanted to capitalize on an opportunity to get more eyes on the product you know you have them vacate the title and run some sort of tournament that you know ends at the next set of tapings i mean already you got elgin the number one contender so automatically he you know, you put him in the finals and uh, you could really do something. You, it, it really gives an opportunity. But, you know, I think you and me, had talked about, you know, they might want to stick to their guns and just keep the belt on him. I just really don't know how you have your world champion, you know, miss six weeks of uh, television, not be on television. And and it'd be fine if this was a scenario where they were taping live, then it wouldn't be as bad because what we probably just it probably just be two weeks and you could just have them make an appearance. Mm-hmm. I th- I think the vignettes are going to really be telling how they do how they do those. But once again, like I said, I mean, if keeping the title on him and we're, we're not going to have a champion for the whole month of May, like, um, yeah, I just don't get see how that goes over. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do. I think you're right, because uh, they did say, I think Cage will uh, have a video next week with him giving us updates on things and stuff like that. So it, it'll definitely be interesting to see. Um, the other big news coming out of Rebellion was the uh, 
the Impact Plus app, which replaces the uh, Global Wrestling Network. Um, they are going to be doing live shows every month on the the app, which will, I guess, replace the one night onlys because they're still doing the Twitch specials, I believe, monthly. So uh, it's good to see them running more live shows. Um, I mean, the only thing, the only gripe that I've had with them is that I wish they intertwined more with the television show. But I guess, like you said, the way they tape their television shows, it's kind of hard to uh, to do that. Yeah, it just makes it hard to get invested. First, I think this was good. Um, I hate that they waited this long, only because I thought the moment that you know they got you know Jared and, Eric and company were gone. Like, if you knew you wanted to keep keep it, you know, you just kind of just rebrand the name of it all. You know, that way there's no ties to it. But I think this is good. Um, we still don't have a whole lot of uh, clarification as to. Um, you know, what's going to be different as far as can we watch pay-per-views through there or, you know, other things. Um, so I think, and I'm sure that's something that they're probably going to work out. But, yeah, I think having the live specials is going to be great. But it, once again, I just think for some, not everybody, because, you know, some don't care. But I think, you know, having these events, but they don't tie into the TV I mean, it's just kind of just events, you know, when like we've always said, sometimes when you have these title matches on these, for example, it's hard to kind of buy into because you don't anticipate the title changing because you're thinking, well, they've already taken television. So how would they do that? So right. I, I think if they could, you know, make some of them mean something or just use it as a showcase for some of these talents that we don't regularly see, you know, have them compete on there. Like, I think that'll be fine. But, you know, good job by Impact. You know, and then they did it, you know, Don made it clear to plug in this episode. But mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we get some more clarification as far as what else is going to be available to do on the app. Yeah, I thought they had made mention that they were you were going to be able to purchase pay-per-views using the app or they will be streamed along with it. And then I don't know if it's going to be the same price point or if they're going to do something like Honor Club where if you have the app, I think you get a discount on the pay-per-views. So it'll be interesting to see. We will know a little more because their next pay-per-view is July for Slammiversary. So I guess we will know a little more on that as we head toward there. Uh, there was also news this week that both Willie Mack and Rich Swan had signed new multi-year contracts. So, uh, so that's good to hear for both of them. Uh, both talented individuals and um yeah you got anything else said no nah, i think that was pretty much it i mean yeah. we covered everything i thought i really thought the biggest news was the brian cage stuff because i think coming out of rebellion the mindset was you know he would have missed time which i think we both kind of thought like you know he's at least gonna miss a week which meant yeah he's gonna miss the taping so but yeah, outside of that, you covered all grounds, man. Yeah, yeah, because they had said, I think, that he had collapsed backstage and he couldn't even walk. So, uh, yeah, scary stuff. Um, but hopefully he returns sooner rather than later. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what they do with the title situation. But, um, you know, thanks for uh, checking out our review. Appreciate you guys taking the time out to listen. We are over an hour right now. Um, but we did cover two shows, so I'd say we did pretty good with timing. So, Ro, thanks again for joining me. And until next time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye.